I have the pleasure to welcome Olivier Wittmeyer Picasso. Good evening, dear Olivier. Good evening to everybody. Thank you very much for being here tonight. We are really very delighted and thankful that you found the time to come to Basel, to the Fondation Bayer. Um, perhaps let me quickly, just briefly, um, explain to the public your kindship to Pablo Picasso, just to make sure <laughs> that they understand the relationship. So you are the, the son of Maya Wittmeyer Picasso, the daughter that Picasso had with his partner, Marie-Thérèse Walter. Um, who became his main model and muse um, between the late 20s and the late 30s. More yes. Or less. Thank you. Good. So actually, basically, when you were born, your grandfather was already about 80 years old, so you never knew him as the young Picasso that we <laughs> saw now, but more as the, the old Picasso. Um, therefore, let me first ask you, um, how your relationship and your connection to your grandfather was? In fact, I had no direct relationship. I was very young in the 60s, and he was very old, and he was totally devoted to his studio. Um, you can see how productive he was by seeing all those paintings in the late 60s. But I was lucky enough uh, to have a vivid image of my grandfather because at home we had paintings, drawings, sculptures, and pictures. And I had my mother, who was born in 1935, and I met my grandmother, and they were both telling me stories, charming stories of the moments we spent with Pablo, and especially my mother, because she's the one family who spent the most time with her father. And um, they could tell me um, stories about the moment they had um, in Paris. Of course, there was also the period of the Second World War, mm. which was making everything stable, not with no more traveling and everything. So it was a daily life, uh, back to life with their um, souvenirs. And I think that it was very interesting for me because it was normal. I knew I had a grandfather, oh, my microphone. I, know, I knew I had a grandfather who was a painter. And uh, of course, I was surprised by the paintings with the, with the nose and the, the, the eyes <laughs> on the same side. So, but it was normal for me. And in fact, it probably teached me uh, the why not factor. Because in life, you always say, why, why? And for me, it was just why not? <laughs> and the day he died, uh, on the 8th of April, 1973, I, I um, knew this by the television. So it was very bizarre. They cut the program. They say Pablo Picasso died this morning in his house in the south of France. He's said to be the inventor of the modern art. And at that moment, I told myself, this is not normal. And uh, I understood it was bigger than in my mind. And from that moment, everything started. In fact, he was born that day. Mm -hmm. And surely, because in the next days, I was given answers and information um, to questions I never wondered about. And it's very complicated for a boy to discover that not only you have the grandmother, um, I, I knew that in the 30s he tried to divorce his first wife, Olga, to marry uh, Marie Therese, but I didn't have the details, of course, and suddenly I discovered Fernand and Olga and Marie Therese and Dora Mar and Françoise and Jacqueline, so it was quite uh, difficult <laughs> for me <laughs> to have all this in a few days. <laughs> so basically, you never met your grandfather in person? No, and... Yeah. During, during the years after his death, I remember that Jacqueline, his last wife, was very kind to me, uh, was asking uh, Maya, why didn't you come to visit us in Vauvenargo, in Mougins, in the south of France? And there was a rumor at that time that the gate could stay closed to visitors. Mm -hmm. And um, Jacqueline said, but never, never for you, Maya. And my mother didn't want to have any bad experience. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, for what I know, um, from the middle of the 50s, Pablo was receiving a lot of people at home for lunch, for dinners, and a lot of requests uh, from people, ordinary people, dealers, stars. And um, he was mad at Jacqueline for opening the door. So in fact, at the moment, she decided to say, Monsieur is busy. Uh, he cannot see you today. And this is how the rumor came up with a bad Jacqueline uh, closing the door. But in fact, it was Pablo's decision. Yeah, ah, okay, interesting. Yeah. 
So actually, now in the, um, in the movie, Young Picasso, but also in your recent book, the, uh, this one, uh, Picasso, Portrait Intime, um, that was released last year, actually, you are also um, the witness of your grandfather's life and work. Um, and actually, you even produce movies about him, if I'm, I'm yeah. right. Yeah. So how difficult or how easy is it to you to talk about Picasso as one of um, his relatives and also to explain him as an artist and, uh, and person, considering the distance and in the same time this yeah. very proximity that you have? I have a very special place, of course, having uh, the benefit of the name, the stories, the fortune, artworks and everything. So uh, I have to be very cautious about what I learned and what I'm saying to people. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of respect for students, art historians, curators, uh, journalists who are much more specialized in, in, uh, in art than me. So I had to study his artwork probably through the reading of other mm -hmm. books mm -hmm. and through exhibitions like this one, which is absolutely unique. An exhibition like this one today in the Fondation Bayeller is something that you will never see again within 20 or 30 years. It's very complicated to organize. So um, I had a very special place because I knew about him from the outside and I already knew about him from the inside. So I had to make a balance between uh, facts and, and and analysis of his artwork, and the fact that he was in a position to tell the story from the inside, mm -hmm. and especially because after his death, I was old enough to follow the estate process, which was very complex, complicated, but not complicated, um, and especially because France had missed Picasso. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the beginning of the 20th century, the collectors of Picasso were German, Russian, then the American people, and the French ones were divided about it, and especially the national museums. And at probably in 1946, there were less than uh, 10 artworks of Picasso in the national collections. And then it kept like this, probably because of his link with communism. Mm. So he, he was a difficult artist. And um, only one person had probably um, a real image of the situation. It was André Malraux, the former Minister of Culture mm -hmm. of General de Gaulle, mm -hmm. and he knew Pablo, and they had conversations, and he knew that Pablo had many houses full of artworks, so he said the only thing possible for France to have Picasso artworks, which were very expensive, and Basel is known to be extremely <laughs> famous for, for this... Um, kind of uh, energy to buy artworks and to have a beautiful collection in, in mm -hmm. Basel. Uh, he said that it was necessary to find a, a way to, um, to get a museum Picasso in France. And this is how the, the law, the Dacian law, which makes people available, um, able in France to pay inheritance taxes and other taxes today with artworks. So it was passed in 1968 with only one target, Picasso. And he was the first artist uh, whose um, estate was um, uh, finalized with a Dacian. And today, you can see the Dacian in the Museum Picasso in Paris, uh, in the Hotel Salé. And so my position was to follow up this process of the Dacian in 1974, 1975, 1966. And I was even there when they, the family, I mean the heirs, the four children, Paolo, Claude, Paloma, and Maya, uh, and Jacqueline to visit the future Museum Picasso. And I visited the Hotel Salé that maybe some of you have visited before, when it was absolutely abandoned. I remember that we had to enter the building through a window. It was dark, and I was looking at this. I was a teenager. I was thinking, what is this? And finally, it was a good choice, because the war neighborhood has changed, and the museum is beautiful. And today, the collection in the museum, which is about 5,000 pieces of artworks, is the estate, estate taxes that the family had to pay. And the family has decided from the very first moment that France will choose first. Normally, when you do this, you make the different lots for everyone. And then you say to the um, uh, minist Ministry of, of Budget, this is what we propose. And in fact, it would have been stupid. It was better to ask the state to go first and to make a selection, which is, Let's say the 
perfect museum because, in fact, after his death, everyone discovered that Pablo has kept examples of his talent. It was more than, ta than talent. It was probably a mission for him to uh, perform and to create so many different artworks in so many different mediums of media. Um, and he kept, during his life, examples. Of course, less than that per from that period because it was poor and it was necessary to sell, and much more after. And this is why you have so many masterpieces in, in Paris. Great. Um, actually, perhaps to come back to the movie that we saw um, tonight, um, can you perhaps, since you are also involved and um, well, the main witness in the in the movie, can you perhaps tell us a little bit something about the genesis about, um, of uh, Phil Grafsby's movie and um, yeah, how you were involved, um, apart also from being the witness um, yeah. in the in the movie? I, I know Phil Grafsby, which is a uh, an English writer and a producer. Um, for quite a long time, I knew about his wonderful idea to do an exhibition on screen. Like you have opera, you go to a movie theater and you watch an opera live, and it was a good idea to offer people who are not living in a bad city to see incredible in exhibitions on screen. So he told me about this Picasso project, um, and I thought it was going to be very difficult very difficult um, to cover the period, to have access to the artworks, to get testimonies, because in fact, there are no witnesses of that time. Everybody is dead. So uh, I produced documentaries about Pablo Picasso, but hopefully I covered other periods. It was easier to find testimonies. But uh, it told me he was really dedicated to do it, and the fact is that he had to wait. And the good thing is that at the moment he was starting to production, this exhibition, the young Picasso, or Picasso Bleu et Rose mm -hmm. in Paris, were announced. So in fact, he was very lucky about that. But um, he asked me to be uh, one of the, of the participants, and I told him that I was very cautious because it's a period that I didn't know. Of course, I studied it how, uh, in a certain way, and I knew that there were other people from museums, curators, directors, to be in the, in the show. So I, I'm, I was maybe the the missing link um, in this story to uh, be able to talk about what I knew about Pablo and his state of mind at that time. And it was refreshing for me not to talk about Marie-Thérèse. Yeah. <laughs> More about Charon. <laughs> because she would have been no jealousy about this because she was following them. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, talking about yeah, the, um, his, his women, um, you just mentioned Marie-Thérèse Walter, in the movie, of course, that we saw um, and that is mentioned, the first, let's say, main woman in his life is um, Fernand Olivier, you can yeah. say, in a certain way. And she's also more or less the only testimony or witness um, that really kind of wrote something about she really lived. Um, yeah. I mean, she was his partner. She was the partner of the young Picasso of the late blue and then rose peered up to the early cubism. Um, actually, her voice is quite discreet in the documentary, yeah. I had the impression. There are not so many quotations. Um, I, I, suddenly I was wondering, do you know, um, she, she died, I think, in the 60s, late 60s yeah. or early 70s. Did um, Marie Therese Walter, your grandmother, have connections to her or your mother? Did she ever meet her? No, no, but I know that Françoise Gillot Okay. Um, I mean, Pablo, Pablo and Françoise visited Montmartre, and apparently uh, they, they saw her. Okay. I wouldn't say they met her, but they met her, but they saw her. What is very interesting is the importance of a book mm -hmm. published in 1933, because without Fernand, we will not have all those details about the daily life of Pablo in Montmartre, and those difficult days, and those happy days. And, um, it was the same process with the book of François Gillot in 1964. In the first situation, I know that Olga, his first wife, was furious about having a book from a former lover. And uh, Jacqueline uh, was also furious that there was a book about François Gillot. But without those books, it would have been impossible to know about Pablo's state of mind. And I think that uh, 
it was a period when we didn't understand that doing something against the book was in fact helping the book to get a, a large coverage from the media. And, uh, but the two books are very different. I think that the one from Fernand Olivier, who was roughly the same age of Pablo, it's more about love between two young people and the book of Francois Gillot, uh, knowing that they had something like 35 or 40 years time difference, was more the book of a student versus a master. So in both ways, in the content and in the form, it's very different. Yeah, it's interesting. That's true. Um, now perhaps coming back also to the main topic of the movie, um, so the, the period, uh, the, the movie, but also our exhibition at Fondation Bayer has really this emphasis on, on the blue and rose period. So I was wondering, what, is, what are your feelings about these early works, namely, especially on this period, or what is the significance also um, that they have on your perception of Picasso? Because for me, perhaps I'm, I'm wrong, the, the Blue and Rose period also show kind of another Picasso, not only his work and his work or perspective of his work, but also as a personality, you see him for me as a very sensitive, very fragile person also, beyond all the clichés, later clichés of Picasso. So what is your feeling about uh, Of this? course, I try to be very neutral, because he's my grandfather, but I would say that he's our grandfather, because Picasso is so close to everyone for many reasons. You like him, you don't like him, you like this period, you prefer another one. But when I see this, I see the determination of a young man to write his own language, because mm -hmm. he was so talented that he was... Uh, always the best student in his classroom in the College of Fine Arts in, uh, in Barcelona or in Madrid. And he was at some point bored to be copying the, the great masters of the past. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, there was a transformation of the, of, the, um, of the art world at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. Everything was happening in Paris. He had to go to Paris. There's something funny. Um, he left Barcelona to go to Paris to the... International Fair in 1900. Imagine the date is really the beginning of the new century, the beginning of, of his life. And he left in a, by train in a third class coach, which meant wood benches, <laughs> no cushions, something like two days of traveling. And um, when, I, when I came back to, when I came to visit Malaga many years ago, the captain on board the flight say, we have arrived in Malaga, Aeropuerto Pablo Picasso. And I thought, this is a sign of life, to imagine that a young boy with no money was struggling in life to go to Paris, to go where everything was happening, and over a century later, the airport of his native town is named after his name. So looking at those, this period where paint, crayons, canvases were very expensive for him, it's absolutely um, uh, astonishing to see how he was dedicated to have sketchbooks, to prepare every artworks. And for the Demoiselle d'Avignon, there are something like 700 sketches. Yeah, so it was really a research to find a way, more than himself, I think, for the history of art. He was, he was really concerned about the work of an artist, uh, beside of the value of an artwork, it was really determined, maybe to put his name in the long line of art uh, of uh, masters. Of course, yeah. Actually, at one point in the movie, you say um, that he was also a lucky artist. You mentioned this change from La Coruña to Barcelona. That was also for yeah. him a kind of a lucky moment, um, and that you mentioned him as a little king. So as a lucky artist. Now, perhaps it's a stupid question, but do you also see him as a happy artist? I don't know, it's perhaps it's a naive question, but I... With, with, I, the, with the, the stories of my mother and my grandmother, it was always nice to them, always a, a, a nice partner in, in, in love, a nice father, and they had nothing to complain. Even if it was not so easy with such a sentimental life, very, very com complicated, mm -hmm. but he was very concerned by by the, the importance of his work. Mm -hmm. It was it was not a hobby. It mm -hmm. was not a leisure. It was a work, mm -hmm. and I think that his education in art 
was making this very serious. Mm -hmm. So he was very concerned. I wouldn't say sad, mm -hmm. because I think that he was beside or over those uh, human feelings. He was really in a, in a kind of mission that the talent was given, but for a reason. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't say that he was sad, he was just facing the reality. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he's not an artist of abstraction. He needs a model, he needs a person, preferably a woman, mm -hmm. he needs an object, he needs a landscape. But he also, so, as he said himself, his artworks are his own biography. You can read his life through his works. Mm -hmm. And you have to imagine that he went through the 20th century with uh, a lot of politi political facts. And if you consider two world wars, the civil war in Spain, the rise of communism, the fight, uh, the Cold War, and uh, so many artistic movements. And as it is in the movie, he didn't want to be part of a movement because in the mid-20s, all the surrealist artists wanted to call him the chief, the guide, and he refused that. Yeah. He refused that because he was probably uh, performing a mission his own way. So he was not sad, but he was concerned. Yeah, and I'm sure that he was not laughing every day. He was mm -hmm. probably, even in moment of joy, he was probably thinking about something. He was also very passionate. Passionate, of course. Yes. I mean, his life and his work and full of has energy. to do with passion also, in, in the good and in the yeah. less good sense. And full of energy. If you consider that he has been creating until the end, until the, over the age of 91 years old, I mean, it's crazy. It makes, it makes me tired because I see what? How is it possible? Yeah, it. And probably this helped him to live long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, do you have, um, it's a, also a bit a banal question, but I like to um, tell it, do you have a favorite painting in the ah, exhibition? This is a question, but I think that Pablo oh, Picasso... one of the many. <laughs> of course, I'm touched by the period of my grandmother, Marie Therese, and yeah. all those colorful paintings that reflect a, a, a nice situation. But, in fact, when I discovered with time all the periods and all the movements and everything, I think that I can find something in, 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 at every moment. And mm. in fact, with Pablo Picasso, it's very easy. If you don't like the pink, you have the blue. If you don't like this, you like this one. If you don't like <laughs> Fernand, you like Marie Therese. If you don't like both of them, you like another one. That's I mean, I mean it, it's a joke, but it's true. Mm -hmm. I think that there is no other artist who has been able to uh, reinvent himself so many times. Yeah, from the beginning on, more or less. From That's the beginning. That's fascinating. Yeah, I, I was so. fascinated by the very early works. Yeah. He was seven, eight, and then he was 12, 14 years old when you have science and charity. Yeah, that is amazing. I mean, he won a first prize uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a competition, 14 years old. Mm -hmm. Wow. You just mentioned now one, one painting that is also on display right now at the end of the exhibition where we have this little panorama um, of the works uh, of Picasso after um, 1907, so um, based on, on the works um, from our collection. There is this very important painting, which was very also important to Mr. Bayer, Le Sauvetage, from 1932, which is actually for which your grandmother, yeah. Marie Walter, was the model. Um, and the victim. And the, yeah, the victim. And, uh, because exactly, she, yeah. she, she used to swim in the exactly. Seine River, <laughs> and, and this is what happened to her. And so he was so touched and, 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 and uh, worrying that he made the painting. And how is it in general to see your grandmother, so many masterworks from the 20th century? You had, you had a, a close relationship to, to her? Yeah, she yeah. was visiting us. Uh, Frequently, so I remember her. She was this blonde woman. Of course, she was older, but she was this blonde uh, woman, and Pablo was the only man of her life. So uh, it it was not something difficult for her, mm -hmm. especially because they kept a relationship through postcards for Christmas or uh, for birthdays. So until the end, she had this little link uh, with the acceptation of Jacqueline, mm -hmm. of <laughs> checking course. the mail, of course. Mm -hmm. But I think that everything was just a, a nice souvenir. Mm. Until, until the end. And did you recognize her sometimes? Or, or do you recognize her uh, uh, in uh, the paintings? Oh, I mean, yes. because it's like the, the essence, it's, it's, it's not the portrait yes. of Marie Therese Vado, it's like the uh, kind of uh, yeah. ideal of her. But, but you have a lot of classical drawings of Marie Therese. Uh, that's true. Which right. was absolutely like photographies. Yeah. I mean, um, in, in 
every, every period, Pablo was going back to his natural talent mm -hmm. by being able to draw by, by memory, by the way, uh, every person he was meeting. And he was not asking her to pose, very rarely. Or in this situation, he was saying, uh, just close your eyes and let me do. <laughs> yeah, often she's also the sleeping, the dreaming woman. That's right. She represents this side also. Of no, course. and you can see uh, with every period a kind of, I mean, the man was probably upset about the situation and moving to something else, and the art was benefiting of, mm. of the situation. Great. Um, I think perhaps we can ask the, our public um, for questions. Um, I would open let's say, the, the conversation to, to you. Is there any question to yes. Olivier Picasso? <laughs> yes, I have two questions. Uh, actually, the first one you already nearly answered uh, about his personality because he was such a hard worker. Um, you can imagine when you're so passionate that maybe you're not so nice to with the people, but you said he was very nice and always... Uh, uh, Not always, because <laughs> I speak about m m my uh, yeah. <laughs> my situation, but, um, oh, sorry. No, no, yeah, so you, you already half answered, let's say, but uh, yeah, it was just, just, I'm also not a specialist in art, but I was just imagining, because I have artists in my family, especially my son, and, uh, <laughs> and um, I mean, they're sometimes so much obsessed with, you know, doing better and better and better that I, it's very hard for people uh, around. So I was just wondering... Oh, it was probably difficult um, uh, because he was someone free. So um, he was probably in some situation not considering the other people's feeling and because he had something to do. Um, and of course, because we speak about women, but we speak also about relationships. So uh, there were moments of, of being in love and moments of running away. Yeah. And I think that uh, the period of the 20s is very uh, uh, complicated. In fact, it was famous in the world of, of artists and, and art dealers. He was living a very um, bourgeois life with Olga. Uh, she wanted to recognize herself, so this is why we have those beautiful paintings of the 20s of Olga. Um, we chose that Pablo was a, a, a great portraitist, we say in English. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, but um, the situation was not the good one for him. And by 1925, he was tired of the high life of a high society in Paris. And um, he, was, he was blocked, he was, he was Spanish, and they were married under the Spanish law, so they could not divorce. Divorce did not exist in Spain. Mm. Oh, right. And it was really like being in, in jail, according to what I've seen mm. and read. And read. Um, uh, but in 1927, in the Galleries Lafayette, he met my grandmother, and it was probably a rebirth for him, uh, even if it has to be secret. Uh, she was 17 only, and she did not know who was this Picasso. So, uh, for sure, in 1935, when he tried to divorce, uh, it was a complicated situation. And it's very interesting about the society, because he wanted to divorce to marry Marie Therese, who was pregnant. But at the same time, Olga Picasso didn't want to be a divorced woman. And it's the same for all of us. You remember that until the 70s or 80s, it was complicated uh, for the reputation of a woman to be a divorced woman. And whatever she could get half of his fortune and probably a lot of artworks, she didn't want to divorce. So uh, she tried everything not to divorce. And the General Franco came into power in Spain and mm -hmm. abolished the divorce. So Pablo could get only a legal separation. And uh, he kept his artworks. She remained Madame Picasso until her death. It's interesting to see that Pablo's life has been exactly the same situation as the society in the 20th century. That's interesting. It's very interesting. Yeah. And uh, so there were moments of happiness and moment of fight. Okay. And it was the same for every person, like for all of us, I mean. <laughs> and then my second very quick question is about uh, his uh, early success. So in the movie, uh, if I understood correctly, he kind of became successful uh, at the end of the blue period, right? In 1905, he was noticed by collectors and uh, 
um, especially by Gertrude Stein, who introduced him into the Parisian artistic scene. Uh, Pablo had been very impressed by the success of Matisse in 1905, and he wanted to be, uh, he said that, I think, he said, I wanted to be Matisse and I became Picasso. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and therefore my question was, what do you think was the reason or the reasons for him being successful even before he became so special, let's say? Oh, I think that as every artist, he wanted to be recognized as a talented artist. And uh, he, he, was, he was giving real value to art. It was not like in the 19th century when most of, of the artists were producing for aristocrats, royals, and uh, bourgeois. And it was no more into the spirit of decoration. And at the end of the movie, uh, someone, I think the creator of the MoMA, is saying that he had um, changed the perception of an artwork. He was giving the visitor the power of imagination. It was no more like a representation. Maybe the impact of photography has killed this necessity to paint, mm -hmm. to represent things, and now we were moving to another, another kind of feeling with, with painting. Thank you. So maybe another question. Aussi en français, by the way, if you prefer to oui. <laughs> ask it in French. I know the people living in Basel are very involved into art. <laughs> I hope uh, you so. You have a beautiful Kunst, Kunst Museum. Yeah. Is it? yeah. Beautiful, beautifully renovated. You have the Fondation Bayeler. You are very lucky. Oh. And you have Raphael, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you are very lucky to have the support of, of many important people. And uh, yeah. I think perhaps we can close at this point. Ah, ah yeah. No. Merci. <laughs> But I don't, no, no, no. In, fact, in fact, no. Um, Donc tout ce, que, tout ce que vous savez sur lui, c'est au fond à travers des, ce qu'on vous a raconté, le, la, la famille. But, uh, uh, do I speak in, in, in English to answer? En français. Si. En ouais, français. Okay. En oui. français. <laughs> He, he asked me to speak in English. Non, non, mais c'est bon. Là, on peut faire une exception. <laughs> la situation est, est, est peut-être euh, particulière parce que, comme j'étais nul en dessin, j'ai retrouvé une fibre artistique à travers la production, à travers les chanteurs, les gens de télévision. Euh, je suis allé étudier le droit. Et le droit m'a beaucoup aidé à comprendre la vie de Pablo Picasso, en retrouvant beaucoup d'archives, en allant chercher des documents sur sa vie personnelle, euh, à beaucoup d'éléments que je raconte d'ailleurs dans, 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 dans mon livre. Mais ça m'a aussi appris à être très prudent avec ce que je lisais ou ce que l'on me racontait, et d'aller vérifier des choses euh, par la lecture, par des témoignages croisés. Et ça m'a permis, je pense, de ne pas me tromper, puisque je n'ai jamais eu aucune critique sur, le, sur ce que j'avançais. Et je dis que nous... Euh, sa famille, nous avons bien sûr le droit de nous exprimer, mais quand il s'agit de parler de sa vie ou de son œuvre, il faut être très très fidèle à la réalité, euh, par respect pour ceux qui ont analysé son œuvre, par respect pour ceux qui ont été les témoins de la vie de Pablo Picasso, et puis euh, parce que quand on est dans une famille, on a tendance un petit peu à, à enjoliver les choses, à oublier. Et d'ailleurs, je parlais des livres tout à l'heure, le livre de François Gillot qui s'appelle « Vivre avec Picasso euh, », c'était un tabou. Moi, j'avais toujours eu le sentiment qu'il fallait surtout pas ce livre était absolument... Et quand je l'ai découvert euh, à la fin des années 90, vous imaginez, il était sorti 30 ans plus tôt, euh, je me suis dit, mais c'est un livre essentiel, essentiel pour connaître la vie de Pablo Picasso et son état d'esprit dans les années 45 à 55, le, le temps de leur relation, mais aussi important pour comprendre l'après-guerre, le mouvement artistique de l'après-guerre, les relations de Pablo avec Matisse, qui étaient des relations amis-ennemis, un petit peu, hein, ils s'observaient beaucoup, et aussi comprendre le processus euh, d'implication de mon grand-père dans le communisme, qui, au sortir de la guerre, était finalement la plus belle propagande euh, disponible, qui était plutôt proche d'un humanisme, et puis quand Pablo a compris avec le temps que les choses n'étaient peut-être pas aussi claires, il s'en est éloigné doucement, euh, et donc il fallait absolument que... Euh, et donc ce livre est très, très important, et euh, je pense que mes études euh, m'ont permis de... C'est rien d'artistique, évidemment, mais m'ont permis d'être très, très, très euh, juste dans l'appréciation des choses et ne pas faire d'erreur euh, dans ce qu'on me racontait, voilà, qui aurait pu être ou bien trop joli ou bien euh, pas joli du tout. Voilà. Donc j'ai essayé d'être objectif, ce qui n'est pas toujours facile, 
mais euh, j'ai été beaucoup aidé par le fait de ne pas avoir voulu être peintre moi-même. Parce que je crois qu'il n'y a pas de Picasso après Picasso. <rire> C'est quand même une perspective vraiment très exemplaire d'être, ah ouais. ouais, disons, aussi prudent et Je suis capable sceptique. de faire un cercle avec une règle. <rire> vous voyez, pour vous dire comment c'est compliqué. <rire> Maybe la, one last question, une dernière question. Well, in that case, non. thank you very much again, Merci Olivier, beaucoup à for tous. Um, having taken your time. It was really very interesting. Merci beaucoup. And um, thank you to, to the public. Merci et, et je rajouterai une dernière, une dernière chose. Merci pour ce premier jour de printemps. Ah oui, Parce qu'à Paris, hier, il y avait des grêlons. <rire> Schönen Abend, vielen Dank. Merci.